You are strong to say in your mighty name, King of Heaven, come. Lord, this morning we just want to press into you. And we've invited you to come and now we're going to focus. We're just going to focus on you this morning. Lord, receive our offering. It's the only thing we can give. And so we ask that you would receive it. In Jesus' name, amen.
Send your rain, O Lord. Send your rain, O Lord. Send your rain to your people. Send your
shout or the, the sound of our voices. That, what that means, Lord, is we're, we're fixed. We're fixed. We're fixed in our place and you're enthroned upon yours in our hearts and our minds and that's why we worship. 
we worship for praise, but we also worship for position. Lord, we, we do praise you for all that you've done, but we thank you for the position that you've given us in you, and the place that we have, and the, the possibilities that are available, and, and the hope that ever lies before us in the face of hopelessness. And God, I know that all things are possible with you, and so we worship you this morning. For all that you are, all that you've done, and all that you have yet to unfold before our eyes. And so we look forward to your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Welcome to church. Glad you could make it. Would you take a second, stand up, turn around, and greet each other in the name of the Lord this morning. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome back. I know that there have been quite a few of you traveling, some of you that have been sick, but we are all here together under one roof, and it's warm in here. That's all I have to say. I'm excited about that. So happy New Year, you guys. Welcome home. Um, we just want to give you a few uh, updates on things going on uh, that, w since we've been gone. Our church services, we've had a little bit of a break during the middle, middle of the week. Uh, just due to uh, the way the holidays fell, but we're back in motion. We're going to be starting up with our Bible studies. We have a few more families coming in today to pick up gifts, so if you'd like to be out there and help out with that, Rachel will have that. If you are here to pick up a gift, please make sure that you see Rachel. Rachel, wave your hand all the way in the back. So she will go ahead and make sure that you have your gifts. Uh, one of the other things in regards to those gifts is um, we have some families that were not able to make it, and I know some of you have offered to deliver. I asked another family this morning. Uh, Pastor Howard and I will be doing a few of those, and they are local. So if you are open and available uh, to actually uh, deliver a few gifts, please come see me or actually see Rachel afterwards, and she'll set you up for that. Uh, she has a list of those that need to actually go out. So if you can be in prayer for that and possibly consider doing that to, to help out and to help out with some of these families, that would be great. Uh, the other things, like I mentioned, men and women's Bible study, uh, we want to go ahead and let you know that we'll be beginning on the 17th of January. We normally run our midweek studies in the evenings on Thursday nights, so the men will meet at 7, the women at 6.30. We'll give you a few more of those details uh, as we progress in the next week or so. But I do want to let you women know, and I think some of you men should probably look into this, but I'm not going to steal Pastor Howard's thunder on this one. So what I want to let you know is that we will be doing a study. It's a six-week study. Session. Again, starting on the 17th. Um, but the title of this is, It's Not Supposed to Be This Way. And it's a story about a woman who's dealt with things that, you know how things got, keep coming at you? You think, gosh, I'll just get through this one. God's faithful. I know God's faithful. This is going to be fine. And bam, something else hits. And as you're trying to get through that and keep that attitude up of this is going to be okay, something else comes up. And it's a constant barrage sometimes. Welcome to my world. 2019, the first day was perfect. I slept and I don't even want to talk about the rest yet. So that's why this book and this study is coming at a perfect time. And what her header is on this and the statement that she makes is, it's not supposed to be this way, finding unexpected strength when disappointments leave you shattered. So that's what we want to focus on. We want to make sure that we know how to walk through life 
being victorious even when it's hard. And then on top of that, the theme for our year, for I think, for Refuge and even the kids this morning, is watching each other's backs and helping each other through this walk. So that's what this study's about. There is a sign-up sheet in the back. The cost, should you choose to do the study book, is $15. There is a study guide and a video that we'll be going through with the teaching, um, and that's an additional five. So you have a choice to just come to the study and listen to the teaching, Take your, bring a journal, <coughs> excuse me, take some notes, and do it that way and take it home and study throughout the week. Or you may ha go ahead and grab one of these books. All I need to know is who wants the book so that I can make sure that I pick that up before study starts. So that sign-up sheet is in the back. Uh, the next thing that we want to let you know about, I know couples, some of you, have really been just waiting for us and been patient. And we took a little bit of a break. But starting up in January as well on the 18th, it's Friday night. We're going to meet as a couple, as couples groups. Uh, it will be at the Andersons, which happens to be my last name, so it's at my home. And we'll be meeting at 7 o'clock. So the first and the third Friday of the month uh, is how we're going to run that couples group. We'll start this month uh, at the third Friday. Anyone is welcome if you're dating, if you're thinking about dating a specific person, you want to get married or whatever it is, uh, w that's what we're there for. We're here, at, we're, we get together to discuss the things that you deal with as couples so that it doesn't shock you or you don't think you're alone. So please feel free to join us. We're excited about it on the 18th of January. Um, the other things that are going on, for those of you that have been praying for Tony Salas, um, I, we announced last week that he did pass away. It was on the 29th of December. And so um, Susan is doing great. The family's doing great. But we do have uh, information in regards to his memorial. It will be at North Coast Calvary Chapel, or North Coast Church, I'm sorry, uh, here in Vista. The time is 10 o'clock. I believe we have a slide right up there. You can always ask us, and we'll, we'd be happy to uh, fill you in. We'll go ahead and post that up as well on the website and on the Facebook page if you need to write that down. But if you are interested, what they are asking is that if you do want or feel led to make it, um, to send flowers or anything of that nature, they ask that maybe in lieu of doing that, that you would send uh, monetary gifts to the Tony Solace Memorial Fund, and that would take care of and help, uh, help the family out in dealing with the things going on with that. Uh, I think that that is it for me. Is there anyone here that is celebrating or we missed a birthday during the holidays or an anniversary? Anybody at all? Lings? Why don't you stand on up? Do you see? I have to do this. This is like the first day back of the year, and I'm not, I'm gonna have to put, pull tooth and nail. So we got an anniversary, December 29th. They're brand new grandparents. They're gonna do it again in a couple of months, and they were visiting, and they're here. And how many years do we have now? 33 years. Everyone, congratulate them. Come on, it's okay. <laughs> Okay, now that they were brave enough to stand up and do that, is there anyone else? Anyone else? Is that it? All right, we're not singing happy birthday. What we are going to do is we're going to have Pastor Howard pray, not only for you guys, but for the offering. And with that, we're going to go ahead and excuse the kids, you guys. God bless you. Let's pray for the links. Those of you that are around, could you, as the children are leaving, kind of aim a hand at Steve and Kathy? aim a hand that way because they need all the blessing and help they can get father we ask that you would uh, you would bless steve and kathy and their grandbaby and their family and their traveling back and forth and all that they do lord for jobs and employment and bills and all of that would you overwhelm them with blessing and father we thank you for what you've managed to do in and through their lives for all these years and we celebrate you involved in 33 years of keeping a relationship between a man and a woman together. <laughs> what an amazing thing, and we celebrate that. And only you could have done it, so we ask you to continually bless them through it. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. Uh, just a sideline. Uh, is anybody rooting for the Bears today? Is anybody? I guess I'm alone. Uh, it's okay, you know, I, I, I grew up in Chicago and 1985 is just, I look back upon it wistfully, hoping that Chicago will reign supreme. Yeah. I 
I wanted to bring you for our offering this morning a prayer. Um, you know, the thing about the, the solace thing before I go any further. Um, yeah, if you can support that. She's a widow and she basically has nothing. The solaces were incredibly indigent. They didn't have a lot. And we're going to do what we can as refuge to make sure she's okay. Yeah, because that's our job, isn't it? Church, hello? Is that our job? If so we're gonna we're gonna keep an eye on her. Um, like we always say, we're not about buildings or bigger this and bigger better that. We're about people. And we want to take care of her. So be praying for her and uh, the boys are fine, but Susan is the one I'm worried about. Because Susan doesn't have much. So, so I wanted to give you an offering song. So let's pray. Father, would you bless our tithe and offering? God, as we're together here this morning, I, I, I just, just so thrilled at this prospect of living life with you. And so, Lord, I pray that in that regard, God, would you use us to live life like you live it, to see things like you see, to do things like you do, that we might be a light. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart, Lord, I need Yeah. 
hand, I'd like you to open it to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. chapter 12 and then Luke chapter 6. We're going to look at a couple things this morning, folks. Boy, how the new year has prompted some changes in our world, has it not? I mean, people are completely, I mean, it's just like everything is ramped up and people are completely insane right now. Uh, they're insane on the left and insane on the right. There's all kinds of violence in our society and in our world. And uh, there's a lot of people who just don't appreciate the changes that are happening. It's hard. Adaptation is tough. And if there's anything that we can do, I was talking, I was having a, a conversation with some family members this last week, and, and I asked them this question. It's something that I've asked you before. If there's anything that, that we need as believers, and the, the church is supposedly famous for this, and they were powerful at this in the first century, not so good today. And it's this, having a sense of calm as you're approaching the challenges and the changes that you're facing in your life right now. Because I know we're coming from all different places. Some people are trying to get pregnant, others are trying not to get pregnant. There are people who are trying to get a job, somebody trying to move up in their job. There are family troubles, trials. In our house, it's plumbing and cars and, you know, it's just the list keeps going. I have, I actually was telling somebody, I actually have uh, one humidifier and four fans going at my house right now. And the fans are like, oh. Am I muted now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay, good. All right, so anyway, getting back to what I was saying, everybody on Facebook is looking and going, what is he talking about? But anyway, um, so the, the humidifier is even louder than that, so we have all of these challenges, and how do you approach calmly in, a, in the face of chaos? Does anybody need any calm today? Just asking, does anybody need any calm today? Well, if there's any flaming Pentecostals in the audience, if you would, just raise your hand and go, glory. Okay, we got about five of them. There's some of you. Yeah, okay, that's good. Well, I think I have an answer. Actually, I don't have an answer, but Jesus sure does. Let's pray. God, would you bless this, our Bible study, as we head into it. We need to hear your voice. Lord, give us eyes to see, a heart to receive, a mind open and willing, and Father. Father, we just, just so gratefully come and ask, God, would you give us peace? You prayed for it. I remember you prayed for it. You even told the disciples that you would deliver it. And so we're asking for it in the midst of these, our troubling times. As the church through the century, centuries have prayed, we're praying today in Jesus' name. Verse 31, in the face of chaos, Jesus says, but seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. And immediately, when I read a verse like that, I'm thinking, all these things, what things? I mean, what are things? And in Jesus' mind right now, the things are the stuff. If I could give it a, you know, a, a word that you might wrap your mind around, it's the stuff. The illusion here is there is something in life that has way more valuable or is way more valuable than your stuff. The stuff, you know, we talked about it last week, the stuff you put into you, or the stuff that you put on you. The stuff that you put into you is essential. The stuff that you put onto you is just basically non-essential. 
you can be flexible. That's what Jesus has been pressing into the hearts and the minds of first century people who've been following him around in the middle of occupied territory there in Israel. People who are basically freaked out about everything. I mean, they had taxation without representation. They had Rome in charge and basically controlling everything from trade routes and trade to life itself, just community life. They would roll in and take what they wanted and roll back out again. I mean, they were freaked out about everything. They were watching Greek, Greco-Roman culture come in and invade their culture. Their kids were going south. I mean, everything was changing in such a way that it, did, it went from bad to worse, actually. And, and in the midst of all of that, there, there's no activity from God. You realize at this moment, before Jesus rolls up, there's probably 430 years of silence they haven't heard God's voice. Nobody's talking like anointed or profound words. It's just silent. And Jesus shows up. And these poor people are nothing more than sheep being led to the slaughter. They actually had a legitimate lack of stuff. If there were ever a group of people that needed stuff, needed a little extra stuff, it would have been them. And if they ever get any extra stuff, they, if they don't hide it, they hoard it, and if they don't hide it and hoard it, they consume it because they're afraid they're going to lose their stuff. These were not at all like America. These people were, were not at all like Americans, and they were surrounded and wreathed in fear. And so in verse 31, when Jesus says, but seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. Remember we talked about this? We talked about focus. In other words, being focused on what God is doing, being focused on what he's up to. Kingdom business is not things business. Kingdom business is people business because people matter to God, all people. He's, he, he loves people. He loves hungry people and sick people. He loves weird people exactly like you. He loves people like this. He loves hurting and struggling people. As a matter of fact, if I could frame it for you, think of the words that Jesus spoke in Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. He said this, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, let me ask you, who in their right mind starts to recruit people who are weary and heavy laden? Who wants to build a team on sick, weary, afraid, heavy laden people. I'll tell you who, Jesus wants to do that. That's exactly what he did. He's God in a bod. As a matter of fact, he's God in the bod, but he didn't get any perks. In other words, he didn't exercise his rights or his privileges or even his power as God. That's Jesus, by the way. No leg up, no advantages. He walked through life just like you walk through life with all of this drawbacks, all of its weaknesses, he walked through it all. He never feared. He never feared because he is God. <laughs> He's focused, though. I, I, I always felt like Jesus always had a leg on, up on the rest of us. I, you know, I've always thought that, haven't you? I mean, come on, who's going to mess up? Jesus isn't going to mess up. But hindsight is twenty twenty. Let me just say, if, if victory is truly victory, then failure has to be in the offing, doesn't it? I would think if victory's not victory unless there's failure. That's why I'm going to be so excited when the fourth quarter ends and the Bears reign supreme. I, I know that when there's failure in the offing, you know, victory, that's all right. We can agree to disagree. That's fine. In Luke chapter 2, in verse 49, do you remember when his parents took Jesus to Jerusalem? You remember what that was? It was like his first trip ever into the holy city as a, as a little boy. And, and you, I don't know if you remember this, but they lost God. I mean, that is what we call lousy parenting. You can't even keep track of God. And so they lose God, and they go looking for him everywhere. They spend days looking for Jesus. And where do they find him? They find him in the temple. And what was his response to their somewhat veiled rebuke? He said this, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? In other words, as far as he was concerned, he was focused. 
He was simply focused on what the father was doing from the time he was just a little thing. Later on in John chapter four and verse 34, do you remember the story of the woman at the well? He meets her down there right around lunchtime. She comes down to get the water and she has uh, had a little bit of a colorful past. He knows that, he engages her in conversation. But one thing leads to another and her life is absolutely changed because here is a man who is treating her like a, a value. She isn't second class in, in her world that she's used to, but she's being exalted and addressed mano a mano. <laughs> And how beautiful it was when the disciples walk up and they can't believe what's happened. And they said to him, they said to Jesus, well, Jesus, it's late and you need to eat. And Jesus' response was this, my meat is to do the will of him who sent me. And so the disciples looked at each other and they said, well, who brought him the food then? And this was Jesus' response. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. He's focused like a laser on one thing and one thing alone. His whole purpose in life is nothing more than kingdom business. He's, he's, in, he's in the God business. He was a carpenter. He was still in the God business. That's why I've told people, uh, you know, on Tuesday nights and everywhere I've gone, I, you, you can be the janitor at McDonald's for God. Is that amazing or what? You can elevate the most menial of positions and turn it into a mission. Man, turn your position into a mission. See, I, I think if you're taking note this morning, I would want you to write this down. Maybe put it up somewhere in your home on a post-it. Write these two words down, higher purpose. We always forget that, don't we? We always, we always, so surrounded by our stuff, we're, we're always aiming too low. I think there's a higher purpose involved, and that's why Jesus, he, he, he walked in a higher purpose. Remember this. If you want to fight the fear and the drama in, in, in life, in your family, inside of you, it's this. One word, focus. Just focus, just focus. Verse 32, this is exactly why Jesus says, do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. If you're a first century follower, listening to these words, you're going to respond, at least I'm gonna respond, yeah, right, Jesus, that's really easy for you to say. Do not fear, really? Fobeo is the word. It's a combination of two words. Fobeo mai. And it, it means this. Stop fearing. Just cut it out. I don't know if you caught that he said little flock. He, he sees himself as the shepherd of a little flock, and he's a good shepherd. And you notice he used the word father. He's the father. He's the, he sees the father as being the patriarch of the family. So you're a part of a flock involved in a family, but lastly, he said, he's the king of a kingdom. In other words, you're a subject. So not only a sheep, but you're in the family and, and you're part of a kingdom. And if I'm there, and if I hear that from a guy like me, I'm gonna ask this question. Really? Really? I mean, homie, you're promising me peace, but really? Stop? How does it work? I mean, how do I actualize it? How do I realize it in my own life? Look at verse 33. This is what he says. Sell what you have and give alms. Or as it says in the NIV in Luke 12, 33, he says, uh, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Boy, that doesn't sound fun at all. Everything that I work for, everything that I strive for, everything I try to maintain, sell it all and give it to the poor. What he's actually doing is pressing on a nerve in your life and mine, and it's this. It's this. There is a direct connection between what you have and how much you fear. I'm going to say it again. There's a direct connection between what you have and your level of fear and the level of fear that you fight with. Sell what you have and give alms. The truth is, when he says sell, doesn't mean sell. I don't know if you knew that. When he says sell, it doesn't mean sell. Poleo is the word, and it, what it means is barter. In other words, 
Don't hang on. Trade up. Everybody say trade up. Trade. Say it again. Trade up. Trade. Turn to the person next to you and tell them trade up. Trade. See, fighting fear has everything to do with keeping what you have from inspiring fear in you. Fighting fear has everything to do with keeping what you have from inspiring you to fear or anger, to implosion, all of those things. I mean, relationships. When you're, when you're fighting what you have in a relationship, what do we fight about in relationships? I'll tell you because I've been married for over 30 years. We fight about control and position. Can I get an amen? I don't care. Whatever relationship you're into, you're always wondering. I mean, I've, I'll never forget. I went on vacation with my wife with a bunch of other Christian people, people involved in ministry who understand the whole Jesus concept. And we're on vacation, and I'm sitting in the living room. I, I promise, please don't look at me, you know, like I'm an idiot, okay? But I'm on vacation, and I look at my wife's feet, and, and she's getting ready to polish her nails, and I said, "Hun, could I do it? And so there I am in the living room of this house that was being rented with all of these other ministers, all these people involved in the Jesus thing as a vocation. And they look at me and they go, what are you doing? I'm, well, I'm, I'm, I'm on vacation. I'm polishing her nails on vacation. And, and I heard one of them as they walked out together, they said, one said to the other, well, we know who's wearing the skirt in this family. <laughs> oh, do you see it? Everybody is consumed with position or control. I didn't care because I had ulterior motives. Can I get an amen from the gentleman in the room? Can I get an amen? amen. Let's hear it for ulterior motives. Hello. Yes. See, when you're talking about working, everybody's like worried about their position and who's in charge and how are you, where are you, where do you fit in the grand scheme of things? Everybody's about that position. At work, position at home, this is my house. I earned this, I pay for this. I need to go out and earn. We want control. Out on the road, somebody, I, does this get to you like it gets to me? When you go to make a lane change and there's somebody back there about a car and a half length behind you, you signal the lane change. You could land a Cessna between you and the person behind you. And all of a sudden, because they know that you want to change the lane, what do they do? Yeah. Oh, welcome to California highways. They couldn't just le let it be. They couldn't just, speaking words of wisdom, let it be, let it be. They couldn't just let me move over to the left and pass on through. No! You know why? Because that was their space in line, and they don't want me in front of them. Tell me that this doesn't control our lives. In every way, it infects us. Time, using our time, wasting our time, earning back the time, fighting for the time, wishing you had the time. Money, oh my gosh, here we go, money. You know, and this is the thing. I'll hear a story from someone in my home and they'll walk in and they'll say, you wouldn't believe how much I've saved you today. Do you know what that means? That I would not believe how much I've actually spent today. Because saving is not outgo, saving is income, not outgo. Saving means that you're hanging. Outgo means that you're spending. So don't spend money and tell me you saved money at the same time because the way it works out, the way it works out practically is the money is gone, okay? That's just the long and short of it. Man, I'm preaching today, aren't I, folks? I mean, okay, first century. It is so easy to focus on everything that God wants when you have everything that you need. You ever notice how benevolent we become when we have an abundance and how tight we get when things are tight? We say, God, give me whatever I need and I'll give you whatever you want, I swear. Jesus is saying in essence this to these people. 
If you're constantly focused on your needs, you will never actually fulfill them. Is that weird? You will never consciously, if you consciously focus on what you need, and you're always focused on that, you will never fulfill it. This is why he says, and these words are so provocative to me. I can't believe he actually said this. But he said it, so here it is, verse 33. Provide yourselves money bags. Has that ever hit you like it hit me? I mean, provide yourself money bag? I'm, I'm asking God for the money bag. I mean, I'm, I'm like, send me a sack full of cash, God. And he's like, no, you get the sack. Just worry about the money bags. Acquisition is never the problem in the life of a believer. Retention is. I mean, the huge problem about this is this. We think about the contents when we should be thinking about the container. See, we're all freaking about the contents when, in fact, we should be aware, really aware of the container. That's why he says, provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old. Question. I got a question. Is everybody ready? Can anyone tell me what the big problem is with an old money bag? You philosophers, you have an old money bag. Exactly. A true philosopher, to be sure. Brilliant. Absolutely. And the reason why you have to replace an old money bag is because there's holes in it and stuff drops out of it. Are you tracking so far? See, it's a great metaphor for life. In other words... You can never have a full life if you've got a whole a life full of holes. It'll come out. See, that's what most people do is they focus on putting stuff into the bag on the top while the stuff keeps dropping out of the bottom. I mean, how much money have we wasted? How much time have we wasted? How many relationships have we actually wasted? How many decisions have we made based upon what our perceived need rather than God's direction? I mean, most of the problems in your life and mine can be summed up in one word, holes, just holes. The swimming pool in the backyard is nothing more than a hole that you throw money into. The cars, all of these things, all of these things. In Luke 12, verse 30, for all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. I love how the message put it. Eugene Peterson wrote these words. People who do, don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things, but you know both God and how he works. In other words, don't get sidetracked. God bless you. It's not about the stuff. It's all about the bag. I, I want you to repeat that back to me. It's not about the stuff. Go ahead. It's all about the bag. See, this is important because this is all about, look at verse 33 again, this is all about treasure in the heavens that does not fail. See, when I think of treasure, I'm naturally thinking about stuff. But treasure here, it's an interesting word. It doesn't line up the way you and I are used to hearing it. The word is thesauros, and it means this, the place in which good and precious things are collected. That's treasure. The place where the good things are collected. So, in other words, it's contained value. It's contained value that can't be lost. That's why he says, does not fail. Look at verse 33 again, where no thief approaches. In other words, it can't be taken from you. Verse 33 again, nor moth destroys. It can't be corrupted. Verse 34, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And here's the connection. And this is the only reason why I even wanted to come to church today, was to share this with you. And that's this. There's a huge connection between your treasure and your heart. When you have a big treasure, you have security, peace, confidence, you have, you have uh, all kinds of courage when you have a big treasure. Your heart, by the way, is the seat of your emotions. It's the connecting uh, means by which we connect to our treasure. Your heart is the direct connection to the treasure. 
Uh, example, I'll give you a classic example. You see these TVs? It's kind of an interesting uh, look if you look at these TVs. The TVs, I forget how much we got them for. I think we got them for uh, 800 bucks a piece. So we got a deal on the TVs. But this was the expensive part. I wanna show you the expensive part. The expensive part is right here. This is the case we store these TVs in. The case, just the case, is over $500. So we got a $500 case to store an $800 TV. And why is that? Because we wanted to protect the TVs. So we had to invest in, 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 in a case for the TVs because they would be challenged and moved back and forth and we had to lift them up and stand them and all of that. And, and it, it, as the TVs are safe as long as the cases are there. But if the, the cases aren't there, the TVs are incredibly vulnerable because they're electrical components and you can jostle them and break them. So you have to buy cases for them. We have cases for everything in this room that we set up for sound. It all goes in cases. I mean... And we spent a lot of money in cases. But if your treasure, which is a perfect example of if your treasure is vulnerable, so is your heart. If your treasures are vulnerable, so are your emotions, and you end up coming off the rails. Whatever you value is inextricably connected to your heart. So emotions are the slave of a treasure. Your heart follows your treasure, and if the treasure is vulnerable, vulnerable, your emotional state is vulnerable. I want to are you catching what I'm saying? Because this is so powerful. If whatever you're invested in, in your life, is, is not bulletproof, guess what? Neither are you. Whatever you invest in emotionally, mentally, spiritually, physically, if, you, if, you're, if, if it's not in a case, you're going to pay for it, and it's going to cost you. See, it's not about the stuff. It's about the box. It's about the bag that it comes in. And where is your treasure this morning? And what's, and I'm just going to ask, and I'm going I'm to pause for a second. I want you to do a self-check. What's your emotional state been lately? How's your emotional status been lately? My house is like a hurricane right now. I'm going to walk in, open the door. Before I even get out of the car, I'm going to hear those fans. I mean, uh, and for, for all I know, and you know, there's a couple of people that are hoping against me, but for all I know, the Bears are going to lose today. They're not bulletproof, that's for sure. But, but your emotional state reveals where your investments are. Uh, Lucci and I, we watched a movie this week that was really great. I recommend the movie. It's called Mr. Church. It came out in 2006, and it, it's an interesting movie. It's an amazing movie. Um, it's about a man who has been hired to cook for a single mother who's dying of cancer. The single mother had a boyfriend who was wealthy, and he hired Mr. Church to come in and, and care for her because he loved her, and he wanted her, he knew that she would be indigent. So he hired Mr. Church to come in and, and take care of her. So he cooks three square meals. He spends all day with her. And, and she asks him, how long is this going to last? And he says, as long as you do, I'm going to be here. And, and how I don't have money to pay you. Don't worry, your friend, Mr. So-and-so, he's covering the bill for this and I'll be here. All the expenses have been paid. I'm going to make your meals, everything. So I'm not going to ru ruin the movie for you. But I will tell you this, everybody in this movie is just, they got issues. Everybody in the movie's got issues. I mean, the, the woman's got a kid and she wasn't married and, and then the, this kid's got problems because of that and he's got problems. Everybody in the movie's just jacked up. I mean, it's, it's an amazing movie because the, what it taught me and what it showed me, even in the movie, was in spite of the fact that we're all messed up, because we're investing in areas by giving, what happens is we find healing in the process. And that was the kind of the, the, the moral of the story. See, treasure in your life and mine is the source of our joy. And giving becomes a means by which we access the source 
We give, and that's the means by which we access the source. And the amount that you give is completely in concert with the amount that you receive. The amount that you're willing to, to just surrender is commensurate with the amount that you're going to be able to receive. In other words, I, I remember, um, I think it was John Piper who said this, the size of the scoop that you use for the treasure is in direct proportion to the size or the scope of the amount that God gives. So as much as you're willing to give, God is willing to pour more and more and more. Luke chapter 6, if you kept your place there, turn to Luke 6 and verse 38. That's why he says this, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, right about this time, a guy like me will say something along these lines. And now the ushers are going to come forward and we're going to fleece you for some more of your hard-earned dough. Because if you really want to love God, you'll give. So how much do you want God to love you? $100 worth? $50? $1,000 worth? No, I'm not going to do that. I hate that. Because that's not even the spirit of what Jesus is saying here. He, he's, he's simply saying this, the amount that you hang on to is in direct proportion to the level of pathology and fear that you're having to deal with. See, you're having to deal with so much is because you're hanging on to too much. And it's time to start letting things go. Let it go. Let it go. Turn to the person next to you and just say, let it go. And then on top of that, when we're talking about walking with God, not only do you have to let it go, but you got to give it up. Are you hearing me? you got to give it up. In other words, you have to start responding in life with the thought that I am walking under the commands of a great shepherd, an incredible father, and a glorious king. I'm a part of an incredible kingdom. I'm involved in an amazing family. And guess what? I'm just a sheep. I got a great shepherd. He takes care of me. The moment you start walking in that is the moment that this year, 2019, turns from a series of unending challenges to an opportunities to give and to pour into life, which takes me to a point. Most of the people who help us here at Refuge on a Sunday morning or a Tuesday night are over the age of 50, most. We have one or two guys that are in their 20s that help out, but most of the guys that are here and that are serving, helping at 7.30 in the morning, they're here to give. They just want to give. And the glory of that, I'll never forget the words of Ronald Reagan. He said, freedom is a fragile thing. And it is simply one generation away from disappearing. And we fight for freedom. But the same is true for this concept here. And the gentlemen that come here, I have to tell you, I am so proud of the servants we have because they're lifting these cases and they're coming in, they're not getting compensated, nobody gets paid. I mean, they just come in and they're faithfully serving. And it's a thankless job but they're here and they're part of a generation that knows something that I think has been forgotten by too many. And that's this, success in life is not about what you can milk from it, but success in life is how you're able to pour into it, how you're able to deliver into it. People are not remembered for the great amount of wealth that they have per se, but they're more, they're more honored for what they gave to us and for what they contributed. And some, even some, dare I say, in the room, need to be serving in one way or another. I mean, it's, it's really great that you enjoy the fruit of a ministry, but let me encourage you, that's only half the fun. Half the fun is enjoying the fruit of the ministry. The other half is doing the ministry. Am I not right? I mean, the glory of that See, when you give, that's the evidence that God is actually working in your life. That's, that's what happens. I mean, I, I think about Tony and Susan. 
I mean, uh, their, their phone's not ringing off the hook. People aren't calling them, inviting them to parties. They, they aren't, you know, always on the top of the list. And it's because they really, they don't have a lot. It's not a big reward in, in their resources. As a matter of fact, I think anybody in the room would be a wonderful resource for them. Yet, the only kind of people that will ever give are the people that God has been working in. It's weird. Do you realize that the first AIDS clinics that were ever put up were run by Christians? Do you realize that? Do you realize that most of the people that I have encountered in rehabs and in jails that facilitate and work and work among the people and are really trying to help, do you realize that the overwhelming majority of them are people who God is working in? It's almost as if God's showing up at jail <laughs> and God's showing up at rehab. And get this, God is calling Susan Salas today. God comes in and sets up equipment, but he does it through people that he's working in. See, because the glory of life is not what you can draw from it, but it's what you're able to pour into it. See, some people are, you know, really in a tough marriage situation, and they're, they're trying to figure it out, and it's bump and grind the whole way, and you're back and forth, and, and, and you're wishing as a man, you wish your wife would get it, or as a woman, you're wishing that your husband would get it, or if, as a mom or dad, you want your kids to get it, or, you know, as a neighbor, you want your neighbors to get it, you want everybody to get it, but how are they going to get it if you don't give it? How, how, how are they ever going to get it if you're not willing to drop to the floor, pick up the bottle, open it up, and start painting the nails? How does that work? How does that translate? I'll tell you how it translates in our world. They look at you, and they think that you're an idiot. Who would do such a thing? Well, we know who's wearing the skirt in that family. No, what you're seeing is exactly what Jesus would do if he were here. Are you saying that Jesus would paint your wife's nails? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Because if he would wash disciples' feet, painting a woman's nails would be a cakewalk. Can I get an amen? amen. Which brings me to this. It's not only your capacity for God is reflected in your giving, not only that, but your Your ability to be stronger and to be wiser and to be more balanced emotionally has everything to do with your giving. Communion. Boy, boy, isn't that giving on steroids right there? I mean, this is my body, he said, which was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He said, this is my blood that was shed for the forgiveness of your sins, for the remission of your sins. Do this, remember me. He, he was the first, well, let me put it this way. It's what he said to Nicodemus. For God so loved the world that he, he gave. And how do we do it? How, how do I connect the dots? I don't allow my stuff to attach itself to my heart. And I keep God where he was meant to be kept, right here. Knowing that my work is God's work, that my wife is God's gift, that my, kill, my children are God's stewardship, and my home and my stuff, God's gonna have to deal with them when I am gone. But for now, I'm just going to take care of it. I'll take care of it. Father, I pray this morning, as we come before you and look at the communion, and we revisit what you have done for us. Because before you came, one thing's for sure, we were freaked. <laughs> we were completely and totally in trouble. And you came to seek and to save, as you said, that which is lost. Oh, God, thank you for seeking and saving the lost. If it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be here. And neither would anybody else here. Father, we celebrate you this morning.
We celebrate you. And Lord, for what we've held back, Lord, we have an opportunity this morning to give back to you. I mean, what a trade that is. I give you all my junk and, and you give me life. Wow. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you for your gift. And Lord, I pray that as we enjoy the communion and we remember you, I pray that we would leave here a little less haggard, a little less worried, knowing that you will supply and you will provide. And I don't need to focus on the stuff. All I need to do is keep my bag ready and new to receive from you. Lord, I pray that we would receive the good in the same manner that we receive the bad. Lord, I pray that we would receive the easy in the same manner that we receive the hard, that we know that all of these things work together for good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. So, Lord, we celebrate you this morning. The ushers are going to come forward. They're going to deliver you the cup. And in the cup, you have two cups. You have bread underneath, and you have the, the juice on the top, you separate the two and, and we'll partake together. Joy will fill my heart. 
feel the need to remind you that all of this comes courtesy of a cross. That God's blessings are never cheap and they're never easy. That they came at a high cost, incredibly high price. I can't fathom what it would be like to stand there and watch God bleed. I can't imagine what it must have been like to stand there and watch Romans lay a whip on his back. I can't imagine it. What a profound thing love is. It makes you do crazy stuff. You're willing to do things that you would never, ever do in any other way had it not been for love. And when I think of him on that cross and gasping his last breath and God actually dying. How, how is that even possible? But the point was clear. When he was buried in a tomb and guarded by Roman guards, he rose. And this is what he said. First words. <laughs> Peace. <laughs> peace. That's the price of your peace. The Romans, the cross, and the death of God Almighty who loved you that much. And I can't help but think if you were the last person, if you were the only person on earth, he'd have done it anyway. Because it's not the size of how messed up you are that matters here. It's the greatness of the Savior that makes all the difference in the world. So when I look at this little wafer in the bottom of a cup, it just screams love that God loves me. And he was able to provide exactly what I need. This is my body that has been broken for you. These are the things that life is made of. Do this and remember me. Let's take the bread together. Thank you, Lord, for giving so much. So it makes the gift beautiful. You didn't have to, but you did it. And while the rest of us fight over our things and agonize over bank accounts and retirement funds and, and kids' college or our college and school and graduating this or achieving that or getting the promotion or being passed over or being cut off on the freeway, all those things that line up that make life miserable, I just think you came anyway. That's love. Thank you for your love. And I can't help but color that love crimson red. It came in the, in the 
the shape of the blood of Jesus. Why? Because we needed to be cleansed. If there were ever a group of people that needed to be cleansed, it's your people. Because we get sucked in just like everybody else and we have communion this morning to remember you and remember that we are forgiven. That we don't need to earn your favor or your forgiveness. We already have it established by your blood. Thank you, Jesus. You said, do this in remembrance of me. We remember you this morning. Let's all partake together. reason than that you found us and you loved us first. God, thank you for being so great a Savior. We love you, Lord. We lay our anxieties at your feet this morning here at the communion table. We run to the table because we're filled with them, and they have a way of attaching themselves to our hearts and dragging us down to the lowest common denominator. And things come out of our mouths and our lives that we're not proud of. And, and so we run to the communion table thanking you for giving us a place to go. You are heaven. And if you're not there, then it's not heaven. Lord, would you establish your kingdom here on earth in our lives as you inspire us to pour into life not to suck the marrow from it. And Lord, would you be our source and our supply? In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. I love you. Thank you for coming. It was good to be together this morning. Now what I want you to do is go out and get.